Hi everybody, my name is Jamie and I'm a solution engineer here at HashiCorp and today I'm going to be going through some things we can do with the Kubernetes Secrets Engine inside of Vault. So to start us off, I wanted to just share with you some of the things that we use to identify what we call high-risk credentials within an enterprise environment. So one of the first things that we would look for is any credential that is particularly broadly scoped, obviously poses you know, an increased level of risk. Um, secondly, any credential that is uh, highly privileged in nature, obviously the, the damage that somebody could potentially do if that gets uh, leaked is, is much more. The next one is how many of our credentials don't automatically expire? You know, these are particularly problematic if they were ever to get leaked. And then finally, sometimes not as obvious, but any credential that is very frequently accessed. Not that something being frequently accessed in of itself poses a, a risk, but it just creates more opportunity for something to go wrong. So any one of these criteria on their own is probably not enough to categorize something as a high risk credential. But if you have some credentials which tick a few of these boxes at the same time, then yeah, it, it absolutely is something that we would call a high risk credential and something you wanna be very cognizant of. So the obvious next question is, once we know how to grade a credential as, as being particularly high risk, where do we find these most commonly? And, and that's what I'm gonna go through today. I'm gonna to show you an example workflow and we're gonna have a look at what credentials we might find there. So the workflow I'm gonna show you is a pretty simple application delivery process where I have my developer over here on the left-hand side who wants their web app running in Kubernetes over here on the right. I'm gonna be pushing my changes through some form of CI CD machine and this workflow really has two obvious credentials that we need to consider. The first one is my developer has some process of being authenticated to my CI CD server. And then secondly, the CI CD server needs to be able to authenticate to Kubernetes to be able to deploy my application into production. So if we were to zoom in to this a bit more, you know, I've, I've simplified the diagram, but realistically the developer is gonna be pushing into some sort of version control system. And then the version control system is going to notify the CI/CD server that a change has been made. And then the CI/CD server will start some sort of deployment job. So if we were to look at the first half of this workflow, let's look at the controls that we, we have. And this is where we see in the industry some pretty, um, some pretty good practices commonly implemented. And that is for our authentication, you know, we find most people are using single sign-on for their identity. Um, multi-factor authentication, absolutely. And at least in the common version control systems, we have very good uh, capability for token lifecycling. How do we stop them long-lived credentials being created in the first place? And then for authorization, look, a, a quick Google search will show you there's an awful lot of fine-grained controls you can put in about what a developer can and cannot do within a version control system. Even more than this, there are you know, branch protection rules, there are code ownership. Um, this first half of the workflow we find actually pretty well implemented. We, we consider this reasonably secure. Unfortunately though, it's the second half of this workflow where we see, at least with a lot of our customers, um, the biggest room for improvement. And that's because we find the CICD servers are usually configured with credentials that can talk to multiple regions or multiple lifecycle environments at the same time. We find often the credentials configured are the same for day one deployments as well as day two operations. We find that the credentials there are, are usually rarely rotated and that's, that's usually something to do with it was set up in a project phase, it was sort of uh, set up and forgot about and now the, the cost of potentially breaking something is too high so it, it just sort of gets left where it is. So let's take our original rubric of what makes a high risk credential and run it across our CI CD server. So would we find these credentials you know, very frequently accessed? Look, if, if we're doing our jobs correctly as platform engineers, then yeah, we wanna be enabling our business to deploy into production you know, as many times a day as possible. 
would we find these credentials to be particularly highly privileged? Yeah, definitely. You know, you're deploying and deleting resources, then yeah, that's a highly privileged activity typically. Long lived, definitely doesn't have to be long lived, but you know, commonly we find very long lived credentials within CI CD servers. And that's more around just simplifying the operational process. You know, less credentials to manage is usually the mindset. Um, similarly with something being broadly scoped, you know, if I create a credential, I can do a lot of things. I've then got less of them to manage. What I'm trying to get across is the second half of this workflow. We see the largest room for improvement most commonly. And that is because we think people are still treating their CI CD servers as these you know, big impenetrable fortresses where it's, it's too difficult to apply these fine-grained access controls. So we just secure that CI CD server as much as possible and sort of leave it to, to be looked at another day, so to speak. So what I would like to show you today with HashiCorp Vault is how we can apply the same fine-grained access controls to the second half of this workflow and make it just as secure as that first part. So the workflow I'm going to show you in a bit more detail looks like this. My developer is going to be deploying their web application with Terraform. And for me, that means pushing my Terraform configuration into Terraform Cloud to do my last leg of deployment. When uh, Terraform Cloud executes my Terraform, it's going to be running inside of a Terraform Cloud agent. And the first thing it's going to do is authenticate to Vault. Once we're able to authenticate to Vault, we're going to ask Vault to issue us a temporary Kubernetes credential. And then we're going to use that credential to deploy our web app into Kubernetes. Now, don't worry, I'm going to go into this a bit more detail as we go through the demo. But this is, at a high level, the process that I'm going to show you. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So let me start off by showing you what Terraform Cloud looks like. So here I've got a workspace with my web application, which is called HashiBank. And you can see right now I have zero resources under management. Now, if I go and start, oh, sorry, just show you my terminal for a second. Um, we can see in Kubernetes that we have uh, no pods deployed, nothing's been pre-configured. And then down at the bottom, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you'll recognize this output as just a list of all the service accounts that exist within this namespace. So if I go back to Terraform Cloud and I start my deployment, while that starts running, I'm going to show you some of the code um, that we're going to use to deploy our web app. So the first thing we'll look at is what our pod definition looks like. So here it's, it's very simple. I'm going to deploy a single pod into Kubernetes called HashiBank. I'm going to apply some labels, and I'm going to tell it which container image to deploy. Um, and then I'm going to expose uh, port 8080, which is where my application is listening on. So the next bit I want to show you is how we do that authentication workflow. So here we can see that my CICD server, that agent that's running, is going to use the Kubernetes authentication method to pull a JOT token out of the local file system and authenticate into Vault. When we authenticate into Vault, we're then going to ask Vault to issue us a temporary Kubernetes credential. And the credential is going to have the role CICD write. And we're going to deploy into the, the app namespace. Importantly, you can see here that that credential is limited to only 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to grab the IP address of the Kube API, and then I'm going to configure my Kubernetes provider, which basically says, here's the location of my Kubernetes API, and here's the token that I'd like you to use. So let's go back and have a look at our deployment. So we can see, as soon as this plan took place, uh, Terraform Cloud is going to tell us that we need to create one pod. And here's what that pod looks like. And um, we went through cost estimation and policy, which we're not going to go into detail today. And then finally, the apply took place where we created um, a single pod in our application. Now, if you look at, if we now go back and have a look at our, our Kubernetes cluster, we can see that our HashiBank pod has been deployed. 
and we can see we have this sh dynamically generated service account that exists at the bottom. Now, if we can check that our deployment worked successfully, we can, um, let's get the IP address of our service and we can check that everything worked fine. So here we have HashiBank, HashiBank running in production. Now, I know I went through that at some pace, so let's go through it in a little more detail. So let's take a look at why that process was so much more secure than what we had previously. So if I was to look at this first section, um, when my agent, which was running inside of Kubernetes itself, authenticated to Vault, it authenticated using the Kubernetes authentication method. Now, that credential that that pod had is only valid for the lifetime of that, um, that deployment. So as soon as that job completes, that credential is expired. And the credential that the pod has access to is only able to, cr to request a Kubernetes credential. And then as soon as that job finishes, um, the pod deletes itself and that um, service account is now uh, inactive. So let's take a look at this part where we authenticate to Vault. Vault makes sure that the uh, request for authentication that comes in is only allowed to come in from a particular namespace, which is where we have our CICD runner uh, executing our Terraform. And then when it issues the Kubernetes credential, it issues it, first of all, on demand. So it's only when it's needed. It issues it with a 10 minute TTL and we tightly scope the permissions that are given to that credential. And then finally, it's that credential that is used to deploy our application into production. So if I was to go back and maybe show you some other things we're within our Kubernetes cluster, we can see we have um, this credential, this service account that's existed for three minutes. So I'm just gonna copy another command off screen um, and generate some more Kubernetes service accounts. And we can see as we generate them, we can see they're populated down here at the bottom. We've also got the controls that if we did need to revoke a credential, we could run a single command and then Vault goes and removes all of them service accounts immediately at the bottom. So that was the uh, Kubernetes Secrets Engine with HashiCorp Vault. Thank you very much for listening.